Good evening, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, wherever you, you are. Uh, my name is John Duke Anthony. I'm the founding president and chief executive officer of the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. We were established in 1983 as a non-governmental uh, educational organization headquartered in the nation's capital of the United States, but with affiliates, alumni, participants, activists engaged in the National Council's programs, projects, events, and activities uh, throughout all 50 of the American uh, states. Uh, this is our 30th uh, consecutive year of holding this one-of-a-kind international conference uh, with a global, interregional, regional, intra-regional, and national implications across the board. There's no other forum that brings together as rich and diverse and widely experienced and educated and practiced uh, a group of specialists on both the Arab side and the American side. Uh, to address issues of common need, concern, uh, and legitimate uh, foreign policy uh, objectives. Uh, to this end, we have a fixture, a mainstay of more than 10 of these conferences. Indeed, the last 10, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal Al Saud is the uh, chairman of the King Faisal Center for Islamic Studies and Research headquartered in Riyadh. Uh, some have likened uh, the foundation as a Nobel Prize uh, like institution. Uh, what you can put it the other way around that the Nobel Prize uh, has to do not just with peace but uh, advances and achievements in many other fields of human endeavors. So does the King Faisal Foundation, uh, which annually awards, recognizes, and acknowledges the distinct uh, accomplishments and contributions uh, to uh, humanity <clears throat> uh, by individuals, regardless of race, creed, color, nationality. Um, so it is without a peer in this regard uh, from anywhere among the 22 Arab countries, the 28 Middle Eastern countries, and the 27 member countries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Uh, Prince Turkey comes uh, to this position and has held it since its inception as more than a family endeavor, as more than a testimony to the many things for which his late father, uh, Allah Yehru, uh, was renowned uh, from a teenager uh, all the way through to his unfortunate uh, passing in March of 1975. Uh, Prince Turkey served longest <clears throat> as the Director General of the Intelligence Directorate, uh, the equivalent of the counterpart of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Ministry uh, of Intelligence. Uh, for four decades. Uh, like his brother, uh, older brother, uh, the late uh, Prince Saud, uh, who also served for more than 40 years but in that role as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, as did uh, both brothers, uh, father, uh, King Faisal, uh, served uh, uh, beyond his 11 years as king of Saudi Arabia, he retained the portfolio of Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, which he had had uh, since the early 1930s. Uh, as a result of those credentials, Prince Turkey was appointed ambassador to the Court of St. James, Great Britain, um, with respect to which uh, Prince Turkey is also sponsored uh, with the foundation a movie depicting the early uh, adolescent and beyond life of his father and the impact lasting, enduring uh, a legacy uh, that he has had on the kingdom's foreign relations and as a role model uh, amongst uh, international practicing diplomats in the 20th uh, century. 
uh, from that position, Prince Turkey then became ambassador to the United States. Um, so these two uh, more recent assignments uh, have provided him with an opportunity uh, to dive deeper into British and American society, arguably the two countries that have uh, been longest uh, the friends and partners and allies of Saudi Arabia uh, from the beginning of the kingdom's uh, 1932 uh, internationally recognized diplomatic position uh, to the uh, present uh, day. And he's the author of the recently published uh, Afghanistan file. Uh, no Arab was more centrally involved in aspects dealing with Osama bin Laden, uh, the Al Qaeda's roots, and the freedom fighters in Afghanistan uh, from the aftermath of the Soviet invasion and occupation of Afghanistan in December of 1979 until the demise of that bold, adventurous experiment uh, by Moscow to reshape Afghanistan in the image of a client state as such as occurred during the Cold War with Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, please join me in welcoming again to the forum of the annual Arab-US Policymakers Conference, uh, Prince Turkey El Faisal, a member of the National Council's International Advisory Board and the co-founder and chair of the Beirut Institute, uh, which he shares with uh, one of our previous speakers, Raghada Biram, the preeminent uh, Arab uh, journalist uh, with uh, years in the United Nations and elsewhere from Beirut, uh, hosting and holding and organizing, arranging and choreographing and concerning an annual summit of some of the world's foremost intellectual thinkers, problem solvers and decision makers in Abu Dhabi and Turkey. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony. It's a great pleasure to be back with you again, although virtually, <clears throat> but hopefully soon we will be able to get together in person. And uh, as I understood that this is the 30th anniversary of your conferences, congratulations and uh, happy birthday. Um, uh, let me start by saying that uh, wherever we look today on the map of the globe, we find that there is a crisis or a crisis in waiting without a clear horizon to find appropriate solutions. Crises are accumulating in the Far East, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa and in Eastern Europe, even Latin America, I, sh I should add. Every crisis can put the world on the brink of a major crisis that could become a global one if not resolved peacefully. Continued polarization of international politics could lead to such consequences. Adding to these crises and polarization is the question of China-US relations, which no one can imagine how it will be in the future, not because of the routine differences related to trade and economic issues, but due to the perceived China global role. What we have witnessed lately in Afghanistan and the ramifications of it is a case at hand that manifests what I am talking about in respect to the strategic threats facing our world. The unfolding drama in Afghanistan is an indication of an end to an era, the era of foreign military intervention to constitute or shape countries according to a foreign design. Democratizing and state building, if not indigenous and reflect the national cultures and aspirations are not sustainable and remain alien to the subjected proud societies, as also happened when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and tried to turn it into a communist state. This must be the first lesson learned from this experience in Afghanistan and the other semi-failed experience in Iraq. However, the perceived future or the uh, failure or defeat of a great power, the United States, and the greatest military alliance, NATO, in sustaining a regime of their creation will have its long lasting impact on the rest of the world. And a strategic configuration in the regions close to Afghanistan 
and maybe on the overall regional international power politics. However, Afghanistan must not be abandoned and pushed to be isolated, but to be engaged with to avoid the danger of being played by neighboring countries in their search of building power blocks or to become a hub of radical groupings. Doubtlessly, such a development with uncertainty regarding American presence and role will impact the overall balance of power in the regions close to Afghanistan and the world at large. Obviously, allies and friends of the United States and the West in general will be rethinking and reconsidering their future away from the Western dominant paradigm that dominated the geopolitics of the region during the last few decades. The impact of the defeat and withdrawal of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan in 1998 changed the world. Therefore, questions about the big impact of this development to the United States, the Western countries, and the world at large remain to be seen. Experience in Afghanistan reflects the strategic confusion facing our world. The world and its regions are facing immense challenges, which if not met responsibly by the community of states, particularly by great powers, the world will continue living in a state of uncertainty that threatens its future and the human progress that was achieved during the last few decades in all fields. Let us hope that what happened in Afghanistan will not widen this state of polarization and vacuum. Such threats entail geopolitical risks and present a major threat to world peace and security. This may take us back to the eras of power politics when the world was divided and resulted in political and economic competitions, spheres of influence, and wars of over resources and hegemony. The situation of the world is a symptom of deep structural problem in the existing international order caused by the failure of our world community to live up to the principles of world good governance as set in the Charter of the United Nations 75 years ago. The international order needs restructuring to be fair, inclusive and reflective of international reality, where power in all its aspects is shared by many power centers. Therefore, without such restructuring, geopolitical risks will continue to rise and threaten world peace and security. The sustainable international order that can preserve peace and security in the world and that can meet the pressing challenges and threats facing humanity must be an equitable and rule-based one. No region in the world feels the danger of such polarization and vacuum than countries of the Middle East. As we all know, the regional geopolitics of the last few decades were shaped by the dominant power and were managed accordingly. The United States was that dominant power for the last seven decades. Therefore, doubts about its role and commitments to preserve regional security are accumulating and resulting in a continued strategic regional confusion and therefore more conflicts and crises. Victimizing the region by the United States abandoning its responsibility toward friend and allies is not a recipe for peace and security in the region. However, the United States can help to push regional states in the Middle East to find their own approach to reconstruct a regional order that serves their national interests and preserves regional power and peace and security, and hence world peace and security. This is a complicated issue, considering ongoing crises and conflicts, but there is no alternative to avoid any ramifications of continued polarization and uncertainty of international politics and any future power politics between great powers. The strategic importance of the Middle East is still holding, and its countries need to be put in a situation need not be put in a situation to choose between great powers involved in a strategic contest. While it is hard to envision the future of geopolitics in the region at this turn of time, a new regional order is needed to be envisioned. However, many stumbling blocks have to be overcome, not only by the states of the region, but by the need for an international effort by the United States and the other great powers to set the stage for a peaceful, stable regional order. There is no doubt that a principled rule-based regional security framework will benefit the conflict-ridden Middle East. It will provide an indigenous regional forum to manage interstate differences 
and conflicts without outsiders' interferences in their regional issues. It can create the needed trust between states of the region to concentrate on their own development and prosperity and cooperate in all fields to the service of their own people. It will contribute to building a peaceful region free of arms races and ambitions for lethal weapons. Issues like the Israeli occupation of Palestine can be ended by this regional construct, especially since the US, which solitarily took to on this problem since the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel, and has failed to bring the, the sought after peace. That issue of freeing Palestine from Israeli colonization is the banner that Iran raises high to recruit its terrorist militias from Lebanon to Iraq to Syria and to Yemen. It calls its military brigade that trains these militias and arms and finances them the Quds Brigade, meaning the Jerusalem Brigade. The same banner is carried high by terrorist groups like the so-called Islamic State and Al-Qaeda to wreak havoc and destruction against all of us. We in Saudi Arabia are sailing our ship in turbulent seas with thunder and lightning ever present. However, times are changing. Through alliance building, financial investment, and new strategic thinking, the kingdom is on the offensive to address its economic, political, and security challenges. May Allah grant us the wisdom to accurately assess our objectives, the distraction to know when it is best to advance or withdraw, and the ability to pursue our goals with both passion and patience. Saudi Arabia has been always faithfully committed to its strategic partnership with the United States. Therefore, the two countries have overcome all difficulties faced in, the, in their historical relationship. In this troubled world, this relationship must be sustained and strengthened to face the new challenging challenges facing our troubled region and our troubled world. As friends, do not lecture us on our human rights shortcomings before fixing your own human rights failings. We are ready to listen to your frank opinions, but not to be pilloried in media organs whose fairness and object objectivity is questioned by your own people. Thank you.